Chris has indicated to you, the situation of what is called the nationalist movement is dire at the moment. We have to admit it, the nationalist movement is a shambles. Now, uh, it's not a proper party, it's not a movement, it's a collection of warring gangs. That's the best you can describe it, a collection of gangs. Um, so, it's not my purpose tonight to give you a talk very extensively and mainly about policy and what we believe in, uh, but to discuss with you or to institute, I hope, a discussion amongst all of you here and elsewhere um, how our movement and how the various parties connected with the movement, uh, if uh, until they manage to unify themselves into a single party, how we're to be organised, what principles we're going to base our organisation on, because at the moment, uh, most, or from what I can tell of it, all of the so-called parties that are uh, represented in the nationalist movement are just gangs and they're not properly constituted at all. And I think this, it's not the sole reason for the lack of success of the nationalist cause at the moment, but in my opinion, it's a very important issue which needs to be addressed. Now, I'm talking to nationalists. I hope I'm talking to nationalists now. And I define the elemental aspects of nationalist policy as follows. Race as the basis for nationhood. Race as the sole, sole basis for membership of the nation. The restoration of British ethnic homogeneity, the family as the first unit of the nation, the assertion of national independence in all affairs, Britain out of the EU, out of NATO, out of the UN, <coughs> restore fraternal relations with our white dominions, commerce must serve the nation, not the nation be expected to serve the interests of commerce, the abolition of usury and monopolies, and opposition to the financial and cultural oppression of all Gentiles by jury. Now, those are the absolutely essential core beliefs, as I see it, of nationalism. And if you're not able to subscribe, in my opinion, to those beliefs, then you may be a patriot, but you're not a nationalist. Having got the basic beliefs thing out of the way, I have to say that those policies, not necessarily expressed and packaged in the way that I've done it here to what I believe is a nationalist audience, perhaps expressed and packaged slightly differently, but all of those policies, or a great number of them, are popular with the British people. They're not highly marginalised, unpopular views, they are views which the ordinary British people, when they're not being listened to by the media or bullied by the politically correct, subscribe to those views. They want, they realise that our nation is under threat. They've been opposed to immigration from the year dot. They want Britain to get out of the European Union, are fed up with being bullied by these people. So the basic fundamental principles of nationalism, which I've tried to encapsulate a little earlier, are popular with the British people. So why isn't the movement taking off? There couldn't be a better time right now for an upsurge of nationalism. I don't necessarily agree, Chris, that just because things are going well in other countries, it necessarily means they're going to go well here. Because each, and this is something I will go into in some detail a little bit later. Each of the nations of Europe have got their own history, their own culture, their own political traditions. And the peoples have got their own different personalities. So um, a formula which might work in Belgium or Germany or Spain or wherever isn't necessarily going to work here. I came into the nationalist movement after being more or less driven out of the Young Conservatives as a 17 year old into the League of Empire Loyalists and at that time as a 17, 18 year old 
I considered myself to be a patriot, and I thought Winston Churchill was the bee's knees, the apogee of patriotism. I had an awful lot of education and learning to catch up with. Uh, and then at one stage uh, in 1962, I heard reports that a new group led by a man called Colin Jordan was going to hold a rally in Trafalgar Square, and the theme of that rally was going to be Free Britain from Jewish Control. Um, and I'd only just started to learn about the Jews, largely as a result of Jewish activities and violence against League of Empire loyalist hecklers at meetings, where we sometimes got sorted out by Jewish thugs. And A.K. Chesterton uh, issued an edict to all of the activists of the League of Empire loyalists, including myself, don't go to that meeting. Well, you see, if you're 18, <laughs> and somebody tells you not to go to a meeting, and these are people who are calling themselves National Socialists, and they want to free Britain from Jewish control. That is far too intriguing a package for uh, a 17 or 18 year old to ignore. So I went along, and to begin with, I was just at the side of the square, and I saw the crowd build up about two or three thousand, mostly Jews, there, and amongst other people at the very front, threatening the most and, and getting the most tasty were people who I'd seen at communist meetings, Zionist meetings, all sorts of meetings which we were opposed to and which we heckled. That's all the League of Empire loyalists did. It didn't go into the Biff Boy stuff. It was just intelligent heckling. And it was always, the, or very largely, these Jewish nasties who used to give us stick. And there they all were assembled at that meeting. And I saw on the platform perhaps a dozen people. I think that was probably three quarters of the membership of the National Socialist Movement at that time. Nicely decorated, huge banner, Free Britain from Jewish Control, Sun Wheel Flag, the whole works there. And I, though I didn't understand and to an extent didn't necessarily agree with everything that was being uttered from the platform, as far as I was concerned, there were British people up on the uh, <coughs> plinth of Trafalgar Square and there was this horrible heaving mass of Hebrews wanting to attack and the police weren't necessarily doing their very best to stop them. So I hopped up onto the plinth at the back and all I did was walk up and down the edge of the plinth and every time they would put their fingers up to try and get on the plinth I would just walk over their fingers. And all I did to, to help that meeting was walk on fingers. And afterwards, um, they had great difficulty, the crowd surged around, getting all their banners and flags and stuff onto a little uh, Land Rover lorry to drive out of the area. And uh, I helped them load, because the meeting was over. And unfortunately for me, so far as Chesterton was concerned, I got onto the lorry and had this huge Britain Awake banner, which um, I was uh, compelled to bring down numerous times on the heads of people who surrounded the lorry. Uh, because if I hadn't done that, then I would have been in pieces and the lorry probably would have been too. Um, and then having helped them load the lorry, got out of the area, I just disappeared. I, I, you know, I'd done people a little bit of a favour. I wasn't too happy uh, with everything, but I knew who the enemy was at any rate. Uh, but unfortunately, on the front page of the following day's Sunday Express, the main photograph on the front page is yours truly bringing a Britain away banner down on Hebrew heads. And Chesterton sent me a very terse letter, not saying, you've broken a regulation, um, I'm going to convene uh, a tribunal to sack you. We, I didn't know anything about tribunals or, or the law or uh, justice, that sort of thing. He simply said, you're sacked, out. Now, I didn't realise it at the time, but that was a pattern of treatment by leaders of a right-wing group to their members, which I think, after umpteen, 62, how many years is it since then? Come on, who's good at arithmetic? It's a long time. I've come to, to see that sort of approach to running a, a political party is unjust and for want of a home 
not being able to remain with the League of Empire Lawyers, which is a more respectable, Toryfied sort of organisation, I fell in with the National Socialist Movement for 18 months. Uh, and then for, for details that I don't intend to go to, that organisation, which was run on a Fuhrer Principe basis, that split, and uh, John Tyndall and uh, Dennis Peary, and with the support of myself, formed another little group called the Greater Britain Movement, which again was organised on National Socialist lines and with the Fuhrer Principe, had no constitution at all. And it was such a, a tiny little organisation that uh, even the demonstration which I organised on its behalf against Jomo Kenyatta, which landed me in Brixton prison for 40 days, wasn't enough to give it the boost and I just got disillusioned and fed up with politics and I disappeared into the undergrowth uh, for a few years. Then I heard news of the formation of the National Front and I watched it, I heard about it being formed in I think 1967-68 and by uh, late 1968, I'd taken an interest in this party because it was a merger of the League of Empire Loyalists and the original British National Party, as run by John Bean. Uh, and I thought, well, if people are coming together, that's great. I'll give it a whirl. But what was the situation which greeted me when I joined the party? It was a split. Litigation between the deputy chairman of the new party, it only just been formed, litigation between the deputy chairman of the party and the chairman. And that was caused by the fact that Chesterton, having had a row with his deputy chairman, Andrew Fountain, simply sent Andrew Fountain a letter, you're expelled. Now, Andrew Fountain wasn't an 18-year-old boy with no money to spend on getting his constitutional rights. He employed uh, Lord Helsham um, to be his barrister, and Lord Helsham took A.K. Chesterton to the High Court and got that expulsion nullified by pointing out that it's completely contrary to English common law, that as far back as 1215, under the Magna Carta, it had been established that you cannot impose sanctions on people, the state can't do it, and private bodies or individuals can't do it, without giving a person a charge, telling them what they've done, supposedly done wrong, and giving them an opportunity to represent themselves before an impartial jury or some sort of tribunal decides on the facts of the matter. Chesterton just, you're expelled. And he found, uh, uh, Chesterton found himself lumbered with huge costs. Uh, and the first annual general meeting of the National Front that I attended at Caxton Hall in Westminster, the half of it was taken up with the whole of the membership voting to expel Andrew Fountain after he'd given his speech. So the, the tribunal in that case wasn't just four, three or four individuals appointed to hear the case, it was the whole of the movement that did that. And Andrew Fountain was carried, kicking and screaming by stewards, out of the hall. It was the most undignified proceeding, and it caused great demoralisation and dismay. Uh, at this time, the, that party had the services, I don't know whether he was a member or not, of a man called Philip Maxwell Eden. I don't know whether anybody's ever heard of that person. I've heard that he was distantly related to Anthony Eden, the Tory politician. I have no idea about that. And he presented to the NF a constitution, how, how we were to be set up, how it were organised, uh, with a leadership body, the National Directorate, elected by ballot of the membership, with the leader of the party, the chairman of the National Directorate, being at that, in, under that particular constitution, elected by uh, the members of the directorate each year. So a proper structure was set up, and a disciplinary tribunal system was set up, and that, um, in my opinion, served the National Front very well. But it doesn't serve everybody very well. 
You see, under a Führer Prinzip constitution, uh, all power to the leader. Very simple formula. And a lot of people like the fascist, traditional fascist ideology, traditional national socialist ideology, and they think the Führer Prinzip is a good idea. It's simple. And of course, from the leader's point of view, you know the old adage of Lord Acton, uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. To which the rejoinder, of course, is power is delightful and absolute power is absolutely delightful. Um, and from the follower's point of view, it's a cop-out, it's easy. You don't have to think, you don't have to argue through problems, you pass all the burden of responsibility up to daddy, and he does your thinking for you. Now, if you've got a saint, uh, some marvellous self-effacing, a cross between uh, the greatest, I'll say King Edward I, and uh, Mother Teresa, that sort of combination of virtues, then perhaps you felt might feel free in reposing your trust in an all-powerful leader like that. But unfortunately, there is, and I'm, I'm an ex-Catholic, and those of you who heard my last speech to a forum a year or so ago, um, I discussed my wish that matters of religion be kept separate from matters of politics. We've got enough to argue about without getting involved with God. And um, we have this concept, though, of original sin. Now, original sin doesn't mean just necessarily the first sin. It means that all of us as human beings are vulnerable to wrongdoing. To tempt it. You don't, you've all heard the expression, you don't put temptation in people's way. That if, you've got a, if you employ a poor person in an office and they're desperately poor, you don't leave the petty cash tin open. That's like an unkind thing to do because it puts temptation in the way. Likewise, reposing all power in one individual, unless they have these saint-like qualities which I mentioned, you're going to put temptation in people's way. And people do fumble and fail and cause corruption. And I think it is necessary, therefore, for political movements, political parties, to realise that we're all vulnerable, that we've all got shortcomings, personality failings, all sorts of things that make us human and interesting, perhaps. But at the same time, we have to provide ourselves with structures so as to protect the movement or the party or whatever it happens to be as far as possibly it can be from these difficulties of corruption by giving somebody all of the power. Now, some people say, well, of course, it worked in Germany. And it has to be said that whether it's admitted by people in the nationalist movement or even people in this room or not, the influence of Hitler and the National Socialist German Workers' Party on nationalists today is considerable. We've all seen uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. We've seen the snazzy smart uniforms. We've all heard, even sung, wonderful patriotic songs that are very politically incorrect, but nonetheless joyous outbursts. We've seen all this and it is captivating. It's wonderful. Uh, the views and the external fantasy which through propagandists like Dr. Goebbels and uh, um, the woman who made Trump, the one of various other propaganda, they're brilliant propagandists and that <coughs> propaganda is stunning now and there's been the temptation among the people in the British nationalist movement and it affected me as a youngster for a while that it could all happen again that all we've got to do is find our Hitler, he'll wave the magic wand, and off we go. <laughs> and I'm sorry, the context of Hitler is so, un and, and the National Socialist Movement, and Germany at that time, that, the, uh, that there are a confluence of factors came together all at the one time, 
which made Hitler and his National Socialist movement possible. On the short term, Germany had just lost the First World War at a huge cost of blood and treasure. Communist, Jewish-led communist revolutions were breaking out. Rosa Luxemburg in uh, Berlin, um, I think it was Kurt Eisner in Munich, sundry other places. Germany was in the process of collapse. And only the army, an authoritarian body, and irregular units of the former German army, the Stahlhelm, were able to deal with these communist revolutions. There was tremendous political instability in Germany. Then came the terrible hyperinflation uh, induced by an economic system dominated uh, by the Jews. It has to be said, 90% of the members of the German stock market were Jews, and they were robbing Germany blind. So all of these various, all of these various factors combined together, plus you had the awful feeling of humiliation of the German people at the conditions being imposed on them through the Versailles Treaty. So that was the immediate short-term political brew that was in Germany at that time. Quite unlike what was going on in Britain. We had a tremendous loss of blood and treasure as well. But, and our people were sadly deprived. Now you've only got to read George Orwell's works to see how badly the British working class were. But as, as that uh, comedy set going about, uh, that was luxury compared to what the German people were having to put up with after the First World War. And there is, of course, a further backdrop to this. German have had those stimulations of that awful, those awful sequence of circumstances which I've described to you. The inflation was such that people wanted to get paid at midday so they could rush down to the shops quickly and buy what they could before the, the, another announcement was made making a, a, a billion mark note only worth, you know, tons halfpenny. And people were rushing to the shops at midday. It got, it got that bad. There was nothing as bad as that affecting Britain or indeed America. But there's a, a, a further dimension to the opportunity which the National Socialists and Hitler had in Germany, and that is that Germany didn't have a long evolution, a long history of slow but steady constitutional and legal development. It began, and we we're all hearing on the radio, on the television at the moment, we'll hear a lot more of it this year, the anniversary of the signing of Magna Carta. <coughs> Which, uh, sets, which is the basis, and I'm sure our friend Adrian Davis here will confirm, is the basis of English common law, or a very large important it's basis okay. of it, where the state cannot take your money or put you on, uh, or impose a punishment on you without a charge and a trial, and a trial by your peers. Now all of us, I'm sure here, however authoritarian you might think you are, like the idea that if you get into trouble, it's not some police officer's whim that decides whether or not you go to prison or whether or not you get fined for this, that or the other driving offence. You can go before a court and argue your case. That's what's fair. I'm sure all of you will remember your time as primary school children in the playground, where English children, British children generally, they're not sophisticated legally, but from a very early age they have a very definite concept of what's fair. I'm sure you, that's not fair, you would be told if you did something wrong in the playground. That's part of the British instinct and tradition. And it was born of this long, long history we've had of our people not trusting tyrants, working against tyrants. Let's look at uh, one or two aspects of this. We had, uh, I've already mentioned the Magna Carta of 1215, but I'll mention one or two other little signposts along the way of the development of a British approach to justice and law and organisation. We had the Peasants' Revolt. Ultimately it failed uh, because the people got stabbed in Smithfield, as I remember, but they had a cry when Adam delved and Eve Spann, who was then the gentleman, um, it was a start. Later on, 
in the 1760s, you had a man called John Wilkes, who edited the North Britain, who criticised the king. The king felt that he was libelled and issued a thing called a general warrant against him. Uh, just all it was, the general warrant meant, I, the king, am annoyed with this man, arrest him, put him in prison. And he was put in prison, but eventually he fought his case, and as a result of his battles in the courts, um, the general warrant was ruled on an unlawful basis, a null and void basis, for treating British people, if for no other reason, other than the reasons set out in Magna Carta in 1215, which you had tremendous demonstrations for Wilkes and Liberty. The American Constitution, which many people regard as a fine document, a fine attempt to try and order a national society full of checks and balances so that no one particular sector of society gains dominance and can tyrannise the rest of society, that document, whatever you think of it, and I think it is a good document in many ways, was written by Englishmen. It wasn't written by bloody Yanks. They were all then... Englishman who wrote that, and that was a product of English legal system, the tradition of the English approach to law and justice and organisation. And then beyond that, you had a, a statement originally uttered by a man who I hadn't heard of too much, called Thomas Fuller in the 1640s. I'm sure some of you have heard of him. But he was the first man to utter the phrase, be you never so high, the law is above you. And that was used by Lord Denning, and everybody attributes it to Lord Denning, be you ever so high, the law is above you. And that approach to law under Lord Denning was of great benefit to the National Front in 1979, because we had hired, under contract from the uh, Great Yarmouth Council, the peer the South Pier of Great Yarmouth, where we were going to hold our annual general meeting. Uh, and in between us signing the contract, as it happens with a Conservative-dominated council, the Labour Party then got in, and there were a lot of commie people amongst that Labour intake. They then became the council, and they just shredded the contract and thought that they had the power to do it. Or high-handed autocracy. If somebody had done that to one to uh, a group of trade unionists. There'd be uproar and general strikes and all the rest of it. They thought they had the power <coughs> to shred a contract with the, the, the National Front. And we went before a judge called Tasker Watkins, who was uh, a holder of the Victoria Cross, a brave man and wasn't prepared to be intimidated by the demonstrations outside his court and by the smearing lies of lawyers for the council on the other <laughs> side. And he, without question, upheld our right for specific performance of that contract. And the council, they got public money, they got public money to splash around, thinking we were limited with money, which we were. They appealed, and they appealed before Lord Denham. And he told them, be you ever so high, the law is above you. And we got that hall. Um, and some of you have attended that meeting. How many people attended that 1979 uh, annual general meeting of Here's the National Front? one over here. Ah. <laughs> ah. 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 Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> you'll, you'll remember... I that, remember. Yes. Were you a member then, Richard? Of course I Of course was. you were. <laughs> yes. Of course I was. You, I, was the national, I was on the director at the time. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're all getting a little bit older, aren't we? <laughs> so... But you'll remember at that meeting that there was a triumph for British justice and British freedom and the rights of the minority against an oppressive dicta dictatorial power got us that meeting. But the meeting was used or attempted to be used by the party's then chairman, John Tindall, to scrap our constitution whereby we had members have rights, members <coughs> elected the directorate, so forth and so on. They would have a leader, and all power would repose on him, and all authority, hirings and firings, preferment, justice decisions, whatever, would all emanate from the oracle of the leader. So, what a, an ironic thing that our 
body of law and freedom started in 1215, came through all these various struggles, and there were great judges like Tasker Watkin VC and Lord Denning giving the odious, controversial National Front the right to exercise a lawfully arrived at contract with a public body, only for that hall to try and be used by somebody who wanted to reverse and go back to the days of the NSM uh, and indeed the LEL, because that was run on a dictatorial basis as well. Uh, you could say it was either ironic or a historical travesty, but that's what happened. In my view, because I was uh, against the proposals that Tyndall was putting forward, his enabling act, um, uh, members queued right the way around the hall to speak in the against queue, was 12 people were on the other queue. Tyndall needed a two-thirds majority to get that constitutional amendment covered. He didn't even get anywhere near a simple majority. And it was that frustration that Tyndall felt over that matter, which he'd been hammering on about uh, for some while, uh, which caused, ultimately, his leaving the NF, forming shortly afterwards a new national front, which didn't take off, and then forming the BNP. And he used to form the BNP the more or less the same constitution that he tried but failed to foist on the National Front. But the difficulty with that sort of constitution is that if you have all power, then you are institutionalising a process of splitting, of opportunism, uh, of corruption. Uh, Tyndall let into the BNP a young man called Nick Griffith. And people, not me, because I wasn't involved with the BNP, the BNP was more or less formed as a result of Tyndall's inability to knock me on the head. So uh, I, I was not uh, involved in this, but numerous people who knew Griffin very well said, you mustn't let him in. He's a chancer, an opportunist, he ducks and dives, you're going to... Tyndall, the old business of somebody who's got all power and thinks that he's there for hubris. Hubris, hubris, hubris. Ah, oh, I can deal with him. Ah, oh, I can deal with him. And it wasn't long before a challenge was uh, for the, the top job came from Britain. There was a notional uh, power in the Constitution for somebody, providing they'd been a nationalist for so many years, got certain qualifications, could stand in opposition. And Tyndall said, oh, I'm not going to sack him because he's standing against me. That, that, that would, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good enough, important enough, and long enough servant of the party for everybody to love me. He'll get a derisory vote. And it would, in fact, strengthen my position, not weaken my position. Hubris, hubris, hubris. By that time, the members had got fed up with John Tyndall, and they voted him out, and they voted Nick Griffin in. <coughs> and what was Nick Griffin's first act constitutionally, not only not to reverse the dictatorial constitution which Tyndall had provided the British National Party, and remember in the debate at Great Yarmouth one of the people at the head of the queue saying no, don't vote for this motion, that would bring tyranny on the National Front, guess who was near the head of that queue? Nick Griffin. But after he'd taken the chairmanship of the PNP a few years later, he and a chap called Lacomba set about adding bells and whistles of oppression uh, and tightening the power of the leader and making it more and more difficult for any power struggle uh, or any power challenge to be offered against the leadership. I won't rehearse, not at this meeting at any rate, the trail of corruption, financial corruption, bribery, the horrors that were perpetrated by Griffin on financial, um, in financial areas, and the goodies that he handed out to his chosen few with all sorts of subcontracting deals, all of the things he was allowed to do because they had this Fuhrer Principe constitution, which is not part of the British tradition and it leads to corruption and it leads to squabbles and splitting 
and it did so, and finally, Griffin himself found himself on the outside. So, what the point I'm trying to get across what is that though the National Front wasn't perfect in any manner of means, from 1970, when it was provided with a proper constitution, through to 1982, 81, 82, when things started to go badly awry, there was a stability in the National Front that we had opportunists coming up uh, and playing games with the party, uh, such as John Kingsley Reid, who remembers the gypsy horse dealer. Um, but we were able to go to a court and show a judge our constitution and say, in these matters, this man has not behaved properly. And because uh, the case was based on a, what, what, what the judges and the lawyers call the construction of our constitution, because we had a good constitution, we were able to wave goodbye to John Kingsley. So, you, 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 you'll never have perfect tranquility in any political party because it's composed of individuals who are naturally testing one another and aggressive with one another. But if you have a body of rules that holds people together, you can't have oppression. And if you do have oppression, you can take yourself and your constitution before a British judge and you will get justice. Whereas if you're a dictator and we've got little or no constitution at all, then you are not going to be well received in British courts. Situation of continuous splits that we've seen, I believe that what is called the National Front nowadays, though it's not a continuation of the original National Front, they're just a group of people who got together and called themselves National Front, it doesn't have the National Front's whole constitution. But at any rate, that group has had a split recently, I understand, in the last year, and of uh, having all sorts of dealings now with the Electoral Commission, whether or not they can continue with a new leadership, but all sorts of complications like that. There are various other parties, which I won't bother to name, and I don't know the names of them all, where they've been set up by an individual with a big ego on his or her own whim, got a little gang around him or her, and... Uh, <laughs> think that they can run a political party just like the craze ran their gang. That's, how, that's the approach they've got. They're the difference, and also, you might also say, exactly the way in which the barons of the Plantagenets organised themselves. Because the early kings of our country were just gangsters. And whoever had the biggest retinue of knights, uh, and whoever could bash more up, more of their opponents on the head, they became the king. And it took a long, long time for this crowd of gangsters to become established and part of the fabric of a constitutional and national entity. Uh, and we have, as I've said at, uh, at an earlier stage, we're now presented with a nationalist movement which is split asunder and is being run by gangs who don't have a proper constitution, and we've got people in this room, I won't go into particular cases, but you see young people coming into the nationalist movement, full of idealism and wishing to help and putting themselves out, and then they are perceived by their leaders not to be wholly brown-nosing them, and they just get expelled. So a young person who is prepared to devote his life or her life to the cause is driven out on the whim of a coterie of gangsters. And it is more than just regrettable because we're losing people, a lot of people are going to leave the cause and take up following football or, or take up gardening or allotment holding or something uh, like that. And we cannot afford to lose these bright people. Anybody who thinks that a Führer Princip structure, such as that which was able to be operated by the German Nationalist Socialist Movement for historical and cultural <coughs> reasons which I've discussed earlier, it's not going to work in Britain because it doesn't follow the British political tradition. And if we're to connect with the British people who have this lively sense of fairness, 
then we've got to have organisations which are structured and regulated in a way that the British people can recognise as fair. Because if we're not fair to our own people within the movement, the British people ask, well, if they're not fair to their own people, how fair are they going to be to us? Um, so, I hope that genuine nationalists come together each can have their own versions of various policies but I hope you can all come together one day in a unified movement with a proper elected leadership body with a chairman who's regularly elected by that leadership body uh, and proper organisation of branches simple things like this for example which we had in the NF which I don't think apply in these various gangs that I've mentioned, that expenditures of branch funds can only be made by cheque with two or three signatures on it. Because people are weak. And we have known uh, in the past uh, people, there's one chap who I greatly admired as an organiser of an East London branch, greatly admired as an organiser, but he's running his own little two or three man building business. And they got into trouble. And somehow or other, National Front funds became funds to subsidise it. He intended to pay it back. But that sort of thing goes on all the time. And unless you have the funds of the party regulated properly, then you're going to lead to trouble. Likewise, the handing over of branch money to head office, as I understand was the regulation in the BNP, whereby a branch wasn't allowed to hold more than £100 petty cash purposes, and that all funds above that had to be remitted to head office where an account was kept. But of course, that's water into the sand, isn't it? Particularly when you've got the affair run by a man like Nick Griffin. So, we've got to be professional. And the British people, they're not necessarily, as on an individual basis, very astute, informed as to the law, informed as to accountancy, informed as to organisational methods and that sort of thing, but they have a collective sense, born of generation after generation after generation of dealing with good men and bad men, good governments, bad governments, heroes and tyrants. We've got this long, long accumulated history of the drive to fairness, which the German people didn't have, because they were only formed as a nation coming together as one single unit in, I think, about the mid or late 19th century. They didn't have a history of nationhood the way we've got centuries of histories of nationhood. And so, if you're to come together, uh, I don't th suggest that having a properly constituted structure for the, is the sole explanation You've got to present the policies the right way and elect the right people. That we know. But this is an important... We all have engaged, without, without let or hindrance, various aspects of ideology and policy. But what is very rarely discussed in nationalist circles is how are we organised? And is the way that we're organised reflective of British political traditions? And are we organise and do we conduct ourselves in a way that the British people can connect with? Because the political party isn't the leader. We all die. And somebody's got to take over. Uh, people step under buses. Uh, people die early of heart attacks or all sorts of things. There's, we've got to provide a structure of continuity. And the reason why the establishment loves the nationalist movement, having these gangster-like dictatorial constitutions, or no constitution, is because they breed in splits. And there's the one thing that the enemies of nationalism want to stop happening. And that is the nationalist movement in Britain building up a continuity. The Tory party has had a continuity over 200 years. It's, you know, like the proverbial oil tanker. It's hard to get going, but once it does get going, it's very hard then to turn around. You've got a, a momentum behind you. And the enemy 
for, through their propaganda and subversion and infiltration. And we, because of our short-termism and our belief that the leader can sort it all out, uh, we have contributed to the regular destruction of a movement, so we never establish continuity. And if there's one thing that a political party, a political movement needs, is continuity. Or, I, my family's always been Labour, my parents were Labour, I'm the, You've heard it speak. You've got to build up that sort of thing. And if movements are forever splintering themselves because they're run like gangs, and the only way you can make a change in a gang is to behave like a gangster. So, I will conclude now by asking you all to think on these issues and to discuss them in your various organisations and to discuss with people who are informed on these matters. People like Adrian Davis here and various other people I'm sure that we could mention um, who will help us structure the movement so that it's relevant to the British people in the tradition of English common law. Otherwise, why should the British people trust us? Thank you for your attention.